Friday chat. Let's get started. So welcome to another Healthy Gamer GG stream. My name is Alok Kanoja. Just a reminder that although I'm a psychiatrist, nothing we discuss on stream today is intended to be taken as medical advice. <coughs> Everything is for educational or entertainment purposes only. If y'all have a personal concern or question, please go see a licensed professional. And hopefully y'all will understand the importance of that at the end of today's lecture. So today we're doing a deep dive into addiction. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in a few seconds when I sort of do the intro to the lecture. Um, but basically today is sort of like my take on how a lay person should understand addiction. And I think part of the problem that we have is that oftentimes when we teach stuff about addictions, we're teaching things from a clinician's perspective. So here are the different things that we understand about addictions and like here are the risk factors and all that kind of stuff. But the risk factors for addiction either apply to you or don't apply to you, right? And, and so it's kind of like if you're in a high risk situation for addiction, like what do you do about that? So today's lecture is going to be a little bit different because it's sort of, you know, here, if I was addicted to something and I have been addicted to things in the past, here are the, here are the things that I would have wanted to know. Like if I could go back and give 15 year old self, my, myself from when I was a 15 year old, if I could try to explain, if I just had one hour or 75 minutes with 15 year old me, this is what I would explain. It's not a whole lot of detailed, like, clinical stuff. There's going to be a lot of neuroscience and a fair amount of clinical stuff, but it's not about, like, being complete. We're not going to talk about particular substances, like, this is how you get addicted to this. We're going to talk about, in general, why do human beings get addicted to things? Like, how does that work? <clears throat> so this is part of our Mental Health uh, May initiative. So here at HG, we... May is Mental Health Awareness Month, and we've been sort of doing stuff pretty significant for Mental Health May for several years now. It's kind of like a really busy month for us. It's a month where we do our best to help the people in our community who need it the most. We try to help humanity in May. A lot of people focus on mental health awareness, which is cool. One of the things that we find, though, is that awareness is like sometimes not enough, right? You actually have to help people like get to where they go. They need to go. So we are trying to do the most high impact stuff that we can this month to try to help y'all the most. So if you ignore us the other 11 months of the year, that's totally fine. But I strongly recommend that you check out the stuff that we do this month because we have tried to select the things because so many people's eyes are on us at this moment. We've tried to select the things that we believe will help you the most. And so doing a deep dive into addiction is really a good example of that. We did a deep dive into trauma last Friday, and we've gotten an immense amount of positive feedback around that. So we also will try to pick certain topics that we think people don't, that people are sort of misunderstanding. So we had a YouTube video about this is why you really feel intimidated. So for example, like a lot of people struggle with feeling intimidated. Sometimes they don't even really realize that that's what they're feeling. And then we don't quite understand like the psychological or neuroscience mechanisms of why we feel intimidated. And in, feeling intimidated prevents us from doing so many different things in life, right? So if I feel like these people are better than me or better looking than me or more popular than me or more entertaining than me, then I won't go do something like go to a party or apply for a promotion or go to happy hour after work. So feeling intimidated leads to avoidance and avoidance leads to so many of our problems. And that's where like, so try kind of, and so what we're trying to do is we're trying to pick these issues that people are really struggling with that there may not be a diagnosis for. Right. And that's what really, we're really about at HG is not providing clinical services. It's that there's all kinds of stuff that you can struggle with, with your mind in your life that aren't necessarily clinical in nature, but we still can use all of our research and understanding and like even some of the teachings of the Buddha to sort of package that up and help y'all overcome a discrete problem. And so feel free to check out that video. It's something that I was really excited to make. Like I thought it was kind of a cool concept. Um, and so that's on our, our YouTube channel. Okay. A um, couple of other things. So in general, uh, you know, we have a lot of other products, services, um, community events, things like that, which y'all are more than welcome to check out. 
I understand that um, like Kruthi, our CEO, did uh, with one of uh, one of her colleagues did a really awesome Discord event yesterday. I think around like entrepreneurship or relationships or something like all of the above. I'm not quite sure. Um, so, we, you know, we have lots of different things where if y'all are interested in stuff like that, right? So we don't like stream entrepreneurship con uh, um, content, but we're, you know, three, four years ago, we started out with a team of one, which was yours truly. And now we have a team of over 120 people in over 12 countries across the world. We help, uh, we've had like coaching clients. We've had over 12,000 coaching clients in 119 countries and our outcomes are pretty good. We're going back to the American Psychiatric Association today because of some of the work that we've done. I mean, this this month because of some of the work that we've done. Um, so we've got kind of good outcomes around that sort of stuff and where we've got papers that are being reviewed for publication, all that good stuff. And so feel free to check out our coaching program. I think we're full at the moment, but you can definitely get added to the wait list and, and you know, new spots open up every day. So don't that, let that deter you. And if you all are interested in more comprehensive content, we've got um, some stuff coming out for you all hopefully by the end of the month. So stay tuned for that. And if you all want more detailed information on like Dr. K's perspective on meditation, like how do I understand meditation? How do I find the right meditation? Check out Dr. K's guide to meditation. And then we also have guides on ADHD and doing stuff. So if you want to do a deep dive into motivation and behavioral change, check out the guide to ADHD because it has a big section on that. Um, majority of it is actually about that. And then we also have guides on depression and anxiety. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, questions before we get can one overcome addiction by himself? What a great question. We'll get into that. Okay. So here's how I know how to start the lecture and how I know whether I should take a question. So when y'all start asking questions that are a part of what we're going to cover today, um, that's when I know we should start the lecture, okay? So I'm going to just answer answer Jason's question real quick. So what would it take to get the Phase Connect girls on here? I'm not sure who they are. Um, but we actually are going to have a video coming out around a about AI and therapy, hopefully within the next week or so. So it's in post-production. Okay? <clears throat> okay. Let's talk about addiction. So, <coughs> what we're going to talk about today is addiction, but it <coughs> addiction from sort of a subjective perspective. So there's a lot of information we have on addiction. There's a lot of good research. There's a lot of good clinical trials. There's a lot of good neuroscience studies, things like that. But the problem is that most of the resources I've seen on addiction are kind of coming from a clinical perspective. So usually the resources on, on addiction are... Here's what we know from like research, and we're going to try to explain all of that stuff to you. So most of the resources on addiction will talk about, okay, what are the diagnostic criteria for an addiction? This lecture is going to be different. This lecture is essentially, out of all the work that I've done on addiction, if I had one hour or 75 minutes with myself at the age of 15, what would I teach myself? How would I explain to a 15-year-old kid or 18-year-old kid or 21-year-old kid, this is how addiction works? We have to understand why we get addicted to things. And this is where a lot of people will get caught up in all kinds of different substances or kinds of addictions. Like, are we going to talk about internet addiction or binge eating or cocaine addiction or, or alcohol use or marijuana or whatever? And those are all important conversations. But the key thing is that if you are struggling with something, you need to understand the underlying mechanisms that allow a human being and brain to get addicted to a substance. On a fundamental level, what is going on? And once you understand the underlying mechanisms, what you will discover is that if you're trying to ask, how do I overcome an addiction? All of the answers will be at your fingertips. Why? Because you understand the nature of the thing. You understand exactly what's going on. 
So if I'm playing a video game and I lose a particular match and I go back and I watch a replay, if I understand the underlying mechanisms of how do you win at a game and how do you lose at a game, then I can understand, okay, what are all the things that I need to do differently? Do I need to practice my aiming? Do I need to practice my coordination with my team? Is our strategy wrong or our tactics wrong or is our loadout wrong? Right? So it, how do you win a game is like it depends on what's wrong. And so once we understand all of the underlying mechanisms, my hope is that y'all will understand from kind of a start to finish perspective how to approach your addiction or someone else's. And so let me give you all a quick overview. So we're going to start with neuroscience, okay? Then we're going to go into, and I hate to say this, but we have to do neuroscience. And neuroscience can be very intimidating. I'm going to do my best to simplify it for y'all. Then what we're going to do is understand how an addiction develops. And you may ask yourself, wait, wh why wouldn't we start with how an addiction develops? It's because once you understand the neuroscience, everything about how an addiction develops will become easier to understand. So then we're going to go into things like risk factors and environment and all that kind of stuff. Because we understand that the development of an addiction has to do with the circuitry in your brain. And if we understand that, then we'll understand how, for example, abuse in childhood leads to addiction. Once we understand that, we're going to look at sort of a snapshot of the addictive personality. So once we understand developmental forces in neuroscience, we end up with a person who is built a particular way. And so we're going to take a slice of that person and we're going to try to understand, okay, what is this thing called an addictive personality? What's going on here? And then what we're going to do is go to solutions. And this is the one lecture that I'm going to do where I think like solutions are actually going to be 50% of the lecture. But the reason that solutions are not 50% of the lecture is not because there's like 15, 15 tips to overcome addiction. That's not what we're talking about. Once you understand the underlying mechanisms, you will understand that there are so many different dimensions that you can tackle an addiction in your life. And in my clinical experience, and I've done a fair amount of work in addiction psychiatry, it's understanding how addiction affects every dimension of your life that actually leads to the best results. So for some people, they may start to think, oh, this is overwhelming because I have to do so much. You don't have to do so much. This is actually good news because if you're struggling and you did not realize that there are 50 things that you can do, you can start doing any of those things and make progress. So while the instinctive reaction may be to be overwhelmed, I actually get very, very, very optimistic when I have a patient who comes in and who does none of these things. What terrifies me is when I have a patient who is doing everything right and they are still addicted. There's a lot of low-hanging fruit, okay? So, let's get started. So let's start with this. <clears throat> what is an addiction? Okay? So, generally speaking, the way that we define an addiction is that it is engagement... of a behavior despite negative consequences. Okay? So in a nutshell, you keep doing something even though it's a bad idea. That's kind of the definition of an addiction. So generally speaking, this results in some kind of impairment of function. So a big question that people have is, how do I know if I'm addicted? Right? Because you can like drink alcohol or use marijuana and maybe you're addicted, maybe you're not. How do you know? And the question is, <clears throat> is it impairing your function in some way? Is it negatively impacting your physical health? Is it negatively impacting your mental health? <clears throat> is it negatively impacting your professional success? your academic success, your relationships. And if you are engaging in a behavior 
that is causing problems in these dimensions, then that's the nutshell of what an addiction is. There's lots of clinical diagnostic criteria and stuff, but this is where, remember, the goal of this is to like help you understand, okay, are you addicted or not? Okay? Now, we're going to dive straight into neuroscience, okay? So, the first thing to understand is that addictions have discrete phases. So when I use an addictive substance, there is the first phase of kind of like enjoyment. Okay? So <clears throat> this is where in the first phase when I start using a substance or playing a video game or something like that, like it's fun, makes me feel better. Okay? And then what starts, starts to happen is as we use the substance more and more, we enter this phase of habituation. So at this point, we're kind of like, it doesn't really elevate us in a lot of ways. So at the very beginning, there are certain circuits that are involved here, like dopamine and the nucleus accumbens. We'll get into more detail of this later. But this is kind of like the first time you do something, there's no habit circuitry involved, right? It's just kind of like, I'm going to do this thing and it's fun. And like, it starts and it ends. There's no long-term changes or adaptations. It's one stimulus, one response, end of story. Then what happens is we start to habituate to it. So as we get a stimulus in our brain over extended periods of time, our brain starts to adapt. And then we start recruiting habit circuitry. And then the third stage of an addiction is when we're screwed, <laughs> okay? In a nutshell. And you may say, okay, Dr. K, what do you mean by screwed? So at some point, we get to the point where our brain is so used to this thing where over here it's creating, let's say here's our baseline. It's creating a positive move from our baseline. And our habituation, use of the substance kind of keeps us here. And then when we get to the screwed phase, our baseline actually moves down here. And now what happens is we need the substance to feel normal. Does this make sense? Like we kind of get used to it. And now what happens is our baseline experience is dysmorphia. I mean, sorry, uh, dysphoria. Okay? So this is the point at which we can't function normally without the substance. It's not giving us anything positive. It is taking away the negative. And our baseline is negative. Okay? This is when we're screwed. This is when we're really addicted. At this point, we can't stop. And why can't we stop? It's because our baseline is down here. So in order to even be functional, in order to go throughout your day and be able to work and hang out with other people and not be stuck in your head and not be like filled with like anxiety and, and withdrawal and all this kind of crap, we need the substance. At this point, we have become dependent. With me? Okay. <clears throat> now, we have to talk about a couple of different neuroscientific mechanisms and, and a couple of different neuroscientific systems, and then we're going to get to parts of the brain. So the first thing that we have to talk about is tolerance. So imagine that I have a, let's say I have my phone, which has a MP3 player, and then I have a set of speakers. Now I want, so in my phone, I've got volume. I have a thing. Okay. And then in my speakers, I have a volume dial. And then over here, I have an output dial. Or this is the actual stuff that I hear. Okay. So let's say that this is too loud. This is kind of the volume that I want. And this is too quiet, let's say. Okay. And so let's say that this is, I'm going to assign a number 15 over here. So I like my volume at 15. So what can I do? So if I have, let's say, a volume of 3 over here, 
then if if it's quiet on my phone what i'm going to do is increase the volume to a five over here and so three times five equals 15. conversely if i have if i jack up the volume to 15 on my phone then i'm going to turn down the volume on my speakers to still get 15. does that make sense so i've got two things i've got a signal and i've got a receiver and i have to modify those two things to keep stuff in the middle range this is the goal so what happens when we have an addiction let's say i've got three molecules of dopamine and then i have five dopamine receptors and the dopamine signal that i'm looking for is 15. okay this is like what feels good this is how i enjoy myself i get a 15. so i've got a five over here i've got a three over here works great now, one day, I decide to use marijuana, okay? And then what marijuana does is I'm going to add, marijuana artificially adds, let's say, two more. And if I use it once, it's no big deal. So I get a 5 times 5 equals 25. Holy crap, I'm having so much fun. This is more fun than baseline. But... Our brain is smart. If I get five, if I add two from marijuana very, very frequently, our brain is like, hold on, this is like too high. So then what it ends up doing is it down regulates our receptors. It literally takes the receptor off of the cell membrane. And now we've gone down to three. And so now what we see is that I have a five over here and a three over here for a 15. Actually, this marijuana is not a great example of this. Let's assume that this is alcohol, okay? Better example. The slight neurochemistry difference. So now we've got a problem, though, because in this new system where we use a substance regularly, our brain adapts to it. This works for caffeine, too, by the way, okay? So now let me ask you all a question. If I don't use alcohol... I've downregulated my receptors. And now I only have the regular stimulus. What signal do I get? Nine. This leads to dysphoria. Withdrawal. Okay. And now what's happened, and this is the habituation process, by the way. This, this X right here is exactly what habituation is. And now once we reach this point, now we've become screwed. Now, you may wonder, okay, and so we'll, we start to see a couple of things. So one is that the risk of addiction increases with the regularity of use. The more often you use it, the more likely you are to become addicted. Second thing that we know about uh, addiction is that the size of the stimulus that you provide correlates with the level of addiction. So what happens for these people? Now I, I need this as a baseline, okay? So if I add two more, now I'm at five, and then I get to 15. But if I ever want to get back to the 25, because that was fun, right? When I get high, I'm not looking to be baseline. I'm looking to have a good time. So how do we get to 25? Well, we've got to, you know, increase to about eight or nine. So now what we need to do is get up to nine. So we're going to add one, two, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And so nine times three is 27. Great. And so if I start to use nine a lot, what's going to happen? Oh, this is too high. We need to get down to 15. So we're going to knock one of these out, right? Then we're down to two. And now even though I'm using nine all the time, what I end up with is 18. Oh, this is back to normal. And now if I stop using 9, if I go back down to 5, now 5 times 2 is only 10. So now I can't use less. I need to use more. This is tolerance. We must understand this principle. Okay? Next thing to understand. So there are a couple of like interesting tidbits that come out of this. So in my experience, anytime I... <coughs> If people space out their usage by a minimum of four days, 
this is sort of anecdotal, okay? There's some neuroscience to support this. Then the likelihood of their, that they're addicted is very low. If people are using daily, likelihood of addiction is very high. Okay, so when people are saying how much is too much, depends on the substance. There's a lot of individual neurochemistry, but I'd say kind of at a minimum, it needs to be four days apart. And generally speaking, looking at drug half-lives and things like that, ideally closer to a week. Okay? Questions? Uh, are y'all lost? Hold on a second. Do y'all understand this or no? Okay, I'm going to keep going then. <clears throat> okay, so now the next thing that we need to understand is that when most people talk about addiction, they focus on dopamine. So this absolutely happens with dopamine in the nucleus accumbens. So as we acclimatize to dopamine, this also causes other problems. Like once we have a low level of dopamine receptors, the problem is that non-drug activities feel less fun. Because if we look at like the signal from a book, let's say a book is a three. And then let's say something like going for a walk is a two. Or listening to music <coughs> is a three. So then what happens with people who get addicted is their receptors are downregulated and things that are otherwise would be enjoyable are no longer enjoyable enough. And this leads to something called anhedonia or the inability to enjoy activities that are otherwise would be fun. Now, this also creates a cycle because now the only way that I can have a good time, we see this a lot in gaming, especially, is that I have to play games because the dopamine stimulation from books just isn't good enough. So I need high adrenaline stuff. But there's another really important circuit that we need to talk about. But well, let's finish talking about dopamine. So there's a couple of other things that we need to understand about dopamine and the nucleus accumbens, okay? I'm actually just going to talk. So. Oh. Jesus. Let's lock that. Okay, let's go. So I'm going to just talk about this, okay? So, why does our brain have a nucleus accumbens? So let's go back from an evolutionary standpoint. As living organisms, we engage in different kinds of behavior. Our brain needs a way to reinforce some behaviors and not reinforce other behaviors, okay? Our brain essentially needs to learn. So like, let's say a million years ago, we're some kind of primordial organism, and we've got like two things that we can eat. We've got like a potato, and we've got a cooked potato. And so if I take a bite of the regular potato, and I take a bite of the cooked potato, one of them is going to taste better. And so our brain needs some way to like understand which of these two behaviors is better. And that circuit is dopamine in the nucleus accumbens. So when we do something that is rewarding to us and helps our survival, we will release dopamine and the subjective experience of that is pleasurable. So generally speaking, the things that improve our chances at survival are the things that give us pleasure. Why does that stuff give us pleasure? It's because the way that we're coded is that if this thing helps me survive, I'm going to make the organism feel pleasure. And if I make the organism feel pleasure, it will learn to do that behavior again. So pleasure and learning are tied together. Very interesting thing and very important to understand. That's why we have both of these things happen in the nucleus accumbens. So now the question becomes, why are certain substances addictive and other substances are not addictive? Human beings don't get addicted to catnip. We don't get addicted to dirt. We don't get addicted to ice. 
So the reason that certain substances are addictive is because from a chemical standpoint, we have all this circuitry mapped out and the circuitry is designed to reinforce the right behaviors. So why is orgasm and sex so enjoyable? It's because it's required for the propagation of the species, right? So imagine two sets of organisms, one that had no pleasure from sex and one that had a ton of pleasure from sex. Which ones do you think would actually like continue to survive, right? The ones that enjoy the sex. So now what's happened in our current society is we, we have figured out that there are some plants out there, right? There's like millions and millions of plants and some of them have compounds that by coincidence activate this circuitry. But now things are really confusing because when they activate the dopaminergic circuitry, what are we learning? Because remember, we're learning something. Generally speaking, though, we're supposed to be learning things that help us survive. This is why the behavior becomes uncontrollable. Because what we're doing is we're learning. Our brain is like, we need this thing. This is helping us survive. So we learn. And this is why, like, from a conscious level, and remember, this is in the nucleus accumbens. It's in a primitive part of the brain that, like, animals have. So then what happens in addiction is from a cortical perspective, your awareness or your intelligence recognizes that this is a problem. Logically, you can look at it and it's a problem, but you can't control the behavior. Why is that? It's because your learning circuitry is like, we need this. This is what helps us survive. The very mechanisms that have allowed human beings to evolve and survive, not just human beings, monkeys, crocodiles, fish, the very mechanisms that have allowed living organisms to move towards the right behaviors are the same things that drugs hijack. And so now all of that primitive mechanism is telling you to use, use, use. And it has nothing to do with like conscious thinking or anything like that. Because now your brain has learned, this is what I need. And think about when you learn stuff, you can't like overcome it, right? So once I learn how to walk, like I can't just start, like stop walking or start walking a different way. Or once I learn how to speak in a particular language, or once I learn how to use particular words, it's really hard to like unlearn stuff. So our behaviors are shaped by our learning circuitry. I know it sounds really, really simple, but like, do y'all get that? Because I don't think most people really understand that. Because what it does is it hijacks your learning circuitry and then you learn how to do stuff and then you do the behavior automatically because your brain has learned it, okay? So that's the dopaminergic circuitry. There is another circuit that we need to talk about, which is also affected by addiction. And this is, no joke, the kappa circuitry of the brain. Okay? So we have these things called kappa receptors. And kappa receptors also get adjusted when we use substances. Kappa receptors are sensitive to stress. Okay? So what, what happens is when we are in high stress periods, like our stress molecules like cortisol and more specifically CRF, so it's not really cortisol, it's CRF, it's a cortisol precursor, activate something called the kappa receptor. And so the kappa receptor is what detects stress. When we're stressed, kappa receptors turn on, okay? So the really interesting thing is that when we use substances of abuse, they upregulate kappa receptors. So remember that dopamine is getting downregulated. Our sensitive, we are becoming numb to dopamine. We are building tolerance to dopamine. But when it comes to the kappa receptor, we are becoming sensitive to stress. Now let's understand why that is. Now let's say I'm stressed out. Oh no, there's so much stress. And then I start using drugs. What happens to my stress? My stress decreases. So the more that I use drugs, we're going to go back to this for a second. Time to do maths, chat. So let's say I have three molecules of stress and I have five kappa receptors. And when I use drugs, it reduces my stress. If I use drugs regularly, my body's like, hold on a second, we need to get to 15, brah. We only have one. So what is our body going to do? 
add a bunch of kappa receptors. Because we got to get to 15. And now let's say that we have a normal amount of stress. Oh, crap. Now if I have 15 kappa receptors and I have three stress molecules, I'm going to end up with a 45 stress level. And now I'm going to feel so stressed out. Y'all get this? So it's the exact, exact opposite, but same principle of dopamine. Now, why is this important? This is important because when people are stressed out, they will use drugs. Right? Because how do you modulate the signal? What have you learned about how do you control that stress? If my stress is 45 and I'm hypersensitive to stress, what can I do to make two of those stress molecules go away? I can get high. So now we understand a really, really, really important part of overcoming addiction. It is exponentially more difficult to overcome addiction when we are in a stressful environment. This also explains why we relapse when we're stressed out. What is the connection between stress and this? It is literally that, and let's understand this, okay? So this circuitry, the CRF circuitry, is the same circuitry that activates if you lose a fucking limb. So if I'm in a car accident and my leg gets knocked off, heaven forbid that doesn't happen, and I am bleeding out and I am dying, CRF skyrockets. I get, a C I get 15 CRF molecules, I have 5 kappa receptors, and I get a stress signal of 45. And so my body is like, holy shit, son, you are dying. Do whatever you can. In that moment, if my brain had learned some way to reattach my leg and stop bleeding out, it would absolutely do that. Do y'all get that? If it had any behavior that it could to make that stress go away, it would make it go away. This is the circuitry that is involved with addiction. It is our survival circuitry. And so when we get stressed out, this is what our body thinks. And our body is like, holy shit, son. This is terrible. We got to fix this no matter what, which is why we use. It's not just dopamine. It is survival mechanisms, which have for millions of years have literally kept you alive, which are now like going haywire. They're like, do whatever you can to make this go away because we are dying. This is the same circuitry that in interprets the signals for I am literally dying and withdrawal are like the same. And if you talk to people who go through withdrawal, it feels like they're dying. There's all kinds of physiologic signals and stuff there too, right? But this is really important to understand because this is also why stress leads to relapse. And we'll get to this more in a, in a, in a couple minutes. But now <coughs> the important thing to understand is with the kappa circuitry, if you are in a stressful situation, it is very hard to quit your addiction. And so dealing with your stressful situation and managing stress is one of the most foundational things at overcoming addiction. And the biggest mistake that people make in overcoming addiction is you try to overcome that addiction in a vacuum. And you don't address the other parts of your life. And if the situation created the addiction, you can't overcome the addiction in the same situation. I mean, you can theoretically, but it's incredibly hard. Okay? Okay. Now, let's talk about how addiction develops, okay? I'm going to skip some of the neuroscience. We'll, we'll do it a little bit more. Um, we'll, we'll do some, come back to it. Okay, so let's talk about the development of an addiction. So human beings need three things growing up. They need nutrition, they need physical security, and they need emotional security. They need emotional support, physical safety, and nutrition. So we have to understand something about the way that human beings develop. So the first thing to understand about human development is when we are growing up, 
we are not making new neurons. We are pruning neurons. So when we're born, we actually have the most number of neurons that we'll ever have in our life. In fact, we have the most number of neurons we'll ever have in our life, even prior to birth. So the process of growing up is not learn the, the process of learning is not making new things. It's actually getting rid of connections. Okay? So this becomes really important because there are, there are a lot of things that will adjust which neurons we get rid of. And I'll give you all a simple example of this, okay? Now that we understand the Kappa system, if I grow up in an environment that is stressful, will I prune my stress-sensitive neurons? Absolutely not. Because we require these neurons in order to survive and function in this system. If I grow up in an environment of security, our brain is like, oh, all this shit that makes us panic and needs us to survive and these stress systems that keep us awake at night and like, you know, make danger feel more real. We don't need this stuff because we're not using it. If your brain doesn't use something, you lose it. This is why we forget languages. This is why we start sucking at video games if we stop playing them. Doesn't quite explain why we suck at video games even if we're grinding them. So if you grow up in a secure environment, you will literally cut away your stress response system because you don't need it. And then what happens is as you go through normal life, you will experience less stress. There are some human beings out there who are like kind of magical because they're like, wow, they like handle things so well. This is such a shit show and they're resilient and they're confident in themselves. That's because they've pruned away half of their stress circuitry. Right? You're kind of weird. So if you look at studies of mothers with depression, the CRF, remember, which is the stress signal in the brain, and the Kappa system is upregulated in children as young as one year old. A mom with depression will have a child who's one year old who is hypersensitive to stress. So now let's understand how does adverse childhood experiences like growing up in a traumatic household or whatever, a neglectful household, parent. And this is where we get to all the risk factors, right? There's a lot of data about this is a risk factor, this is a risk factor, this is a risk factor. It's really simple. You don't have to study all those risk factors. All you need to do is understand what is it, what's the mechanism through which these risk factors matter. And the one mechanism that matters is, does this result in a survival benefit to having a stress-sensitive brain? And if the answer to that question is yes, it's a risk factor for addiction. Done. Finished. So if I grow up with a parent who's physically abusive, does my brain need to be able to handle stress? Yes. Check. Abuse leads to risk of depression. I mean, it's a risk of addiction. Why does it lead to, lead to risk of addiction? Because of the Kappa system. Because what happens is since our Kappa system is so upregulated, I need some sort of artificial substance to downregulate the signal because my brain is so fucking sensitive. Why is it sensitive? Because it needed to be sensitive in order for me to not get beat. Y'all get this? Okay. I see a question. Will I ever be okay? 100%. Yes, you will be. Why? Because we can prune neurons later. This is beautiful. I know it sounds like, oh my God, am I screwed? No, you just need to prune those neurons now. Easier to prune a neuron than it is to build a neuron. Neurogenesis is very difficult. This is why there's a lot of hope. Don't give up hope. Okay? So, <clears throat> oftentimes what we see is stressful situations will basically increase our risk of addiction. Now let's talk about if we grow up in all these situations, and let's just go through a couple of uh, other points, okay? The first is that people are like, okay, like what about genetics? So our current understanding of addiction is that it is a genetic vulnerability plus environment, okay? It Like you can have someone who's an alcoholic who has a child who's not an alcoholic. And now hopefully like I don't need to explain to you why it is not just genetics because y'all understand the kappa system you understand the upregulation of the kappa system when our brain is forming which exposes us to the genetic vulnerability everyone has the genetic vulnerability what determines or not everyone let's say 50 people have the genetic uh, vulnerability 
Why is it that only 10% of them get addicted? The reason is because some of them grew up in the kind of environment that primed their CAFA system and made them prone to addiction. What this also means is that even if you are genetically screwed, changing your environment can change the addiction. Very important to understand. Okay? So, <clears throat> next thing. If we look at fundamentally, so if we have this negative environment, right, and our brain grows up in a certain way, what do we end up as? Okay? What we end up as is something that people will call kind of like this addictive personality. So some people will get addicted to one substance. Some people will get addicted to all kinds of things. So let's understand this concept of addictive personality. So addiction is about your relationship to the thing. The reason we get addicted is because the thing does more things for you than it does for the average person. This is why addiction forms. So what do I mean by that? So I, last time I checked, I don't have an alcohol use disorder. So I'm not addicted to alcohol, which means that I can have a couple drinks, arguably even have a good time. I don't really enjoy it. And then tomorrow I'm totally fine because all the alcohol does for me is like it's some kind of arguable enjoyment. I don't even really enjoy it. But for some people, it does other things. So for some people, it helps us regulate our emotions. So when I need like regulation of my emotions, I will meditate. Or I will go and like get a hug from my kid or whatever. Right? There are other ways that I manage my emotions. I feel pretty good. I'm not trying to flex on y'all. Right? So I'm just explaining. So what, what, what happens is if I have ways to get my needs met, then I don't need the addiction. It becomes an addiction when the only way that I can get my need met or the primary way in which I get that need met is going to be through the substance. So if my life becomes really, really stressful and hugs from my children don't cut it anymore, then I will need a substance to make myself feel better. Okay? So what ends up happening is drugs can start substituting and fulfilling other kinds of needs. And generally speaking, what we see in people who are addicted is that the fundamental problem is that I am not able to manage myself. So I require the drug to do all kinds of like internal management. And, and what I, I, that may not make a whole lot of sense. So let me explain. So if I grow up in a traumatic situation and I feel bad, what is my solution to feeling bad? It's not to meditate. It's to change my behavior and react to my environment in a particular way, right? So if I have an abusive parent, the more invisible I become, the more safe I will feel. So if you think about that child, what does the child learn? The child learns that if there's a problem in here, where is the solution? The solution is out there. Once a child learns this, they this is the birth of an addictive personality. Because now... The solution to problems in here comes from the outside. So if I feel unloved, let me go and have sex. If I feel unhappy, let me go get high. And we'll even see the addictive personality in like spirituality. There's some people who are spiritual addicts. I don't, I don't know, like I want to find like connection with the divine. So I'm going to go to this retreat and then I'm going to go to this retreat and then I'm going to go to this retreat. I'm going to go to this retreat. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to feel connected. I'm going to feel connected. I'm going to feel connected. Why the fuck are you going traveling all over the world to feel connected to yourself? You're right here. So a fundamental problem that happens in the addictive personality is that human beings learn that the way to manage and relate to this crap over here has to do with outside. So another thing that we see in the addictive personality is failure of an independent identity. The development of an independent identity. So what that sort of means is that people get amalgamated with their caregivers. So whether I feel good about myself depends on how this other person treats me. That my emotions become their emotions. And why does that happen? It's because it has to happen for survival. 
If I'm happy and my abusive parent is pissed off, I better not be happy. So I have to become one with them. When they become pissed, I need to be tuned into that. I can't be happy anymore. So we lose sight of ourself. And now we're going to go back to neuroscience, okay? So hopefully now the neuroscience will make sense. So what are the deficits that we see in addiction? One thing that we see. Nope. <clears throat> we see deficits in the insula. The insula is responsible for introspection and awareness of the self. <clears throat> so what happens? How does this result in addiction? So if I don't know, so remember that the way I'm managing my emotions is through substances. But if I am unaware of my emotions, because I have been colorblinded to my emotions, based on the relationship of my stressful upbringing, now what happens is I'll tell you all what insular deficit addicts sound like. Doc... I was doing good for six weeks, and then I don't know what happened. I just relapsed. People don't just relapse. There's always a reason. But it is the internal blindness from the problems in the insula that result in a deficit in introspection, which results in an unawareness of my emotions. And then as my emotions escalate, how does how have I learned because I have an addiction addictive personality that how do I deal with negative emotions? I turn to the outside. And why do I turn to the outside? It's because I don't even know what's going on, in, uh, on under the hood. How am I supposed to fix, fix what's under the hood if I, I'm colorblind to what's under the hood? So the only option that I have is drugs. Y'all with me? So we see insular deficits for people who have addictions. Okay, let's talk about a couple of other things that happen. <clears throat> so our brain is smart. And it has this region of our... Let me just make sure I want to do this in this order. Okay, so let's talk about the PFC and frontal lobes. So our brain is smart. And there's a concept called incentive salience. And so what our brain does is figures out that not only is there the drug, there's the stuff associated with the drug that then gets me primed for the enjoyment, okay? So for example, this is just how our brain works. So anytime there is something that is rewarding, our brain figures out, okay, what are the associated stimuli? So for example, if I go to a restaurant and I hear everyone's having a good time. I see some people are at the bar having margaritas. I start to anticipate the enjoyment of the food. And it makes me hungry. So once you step into a restaurant, you're going to feel hungrier. Why is that? It's because our brain does this really simple thing where it associates stimuli with like the reward. So even though I'm not eating yet, the associated stimuli with eating will make me hungrier and will actually cause a release of dopamine even then, which causes me to crave even more. So when we start to use drugs, what happens is, or other addictive substances, is our frontal lobes get conditioned through incentive salience. And then what happens is we start to get cravings from associated stimuli. So what does this mean? This means if I'm addicted to alcohol and I go to a barbecue, even going to the barbecue is going to make me want to drink alcohol. Think about when you enjoy playing video games. When is, when is the most hype? Right? Because the actual game sucks because your teammates are shit. But boy, it's like, yeah, like let's party up and let's queue. Let's go, baby. Let's go. This game is going to be epic. We're going to love it. It's going to be great. You with me? So then what happens is we start to associate all of these stimuli. And then once, because our brain is able to tie these things together, it's like Pavlovian conditioning. 
And then even the associated stuff will trigger the behavior. So if, for example, I'm addicted to video games and I watch things or I subscribe to a subreddit or whatever where people are posting clips of playing and things like that, if I watch Twitch stream or YouTube stream or whatever, all the associated behaviors will trigger the cravings. Okay? <clears throat> That's mediated by our frontal lobes. The other thing that we tend to find is that people who are addicted to things have impulsivity. So they don't really think things through and they don't really like think about the consequences of their actions. So when people are addicted to stuff like when I queue up for one game, right? Or in my case, it's like playing a turn-based strategy game. Like let's say something like Civ or Stellaris or I'm playing No Man's Sky nowadays. And like... <coughs> you know, or Total War Warhammer. Like, you don't load up Total War Warhammer for, like, one turn, right? It's like one turn becomes 15, becomes 50, becomes 500. And so what happens in, in people is that we start to, like, we don't think about the consequences of our actions. This is also mediated to a certain <coughs> degree by <coughs> the frontal lobes, okay? Okay. So what we need to do, and then what happens is if we have an impulse, which also relates to our lack of awareness, we don't really know where the impulse is coming from, we'll engage in the behavior. So, ah, fuck it, let me just load it up. You also want to understand impulsivity and frontal lobe deficits, just look at your phone. And what I mean by that is pay attention to how quickly you open up your phone without being aware of it at all. Before you even realize it, you'll open up your phone and you'll like be browsing something, okay? It's another deficit. <coughs> Next thing that we're going to talk about. Um, so this is also where there's a deficit in an inhibitory control. Okay. There are other parts of the brain like um, reward and consequence prediction. We already kind of talked about this a little bit. Are impaired. Okay. Okay. So what this sort of means is we don't really think about the consequences of our actions when we use drugs or addictive substances. We assume that everything is going to be okay. Like anytime you get, you know, I had patients who were addicted to heroin. They're not like thinking like, oh yeah, this is going to absolutely ruin my life tomorrow. I only have 50 bucks left. I'm homeless. I'm going to use all this money today. And then unless I find 50 more dollars tomorrow, which is hard to find, I'm going to go through terrible withdrawals and I'm going to feel awful. and I'm going to feel like I'm dying. They don't think like that. They're just like, I've got 50 bucks now. Tomorrow is tomorrow. Okay? Another deficit. The last thing that we're going to talk about is my favorite new part of the brain. So how do y'all imagine we pronounce this? Can y'all read this? What do y'all think? How do you read this word? I just realized I can't actually hear any of y'all. So, okay. <coughs> That's silly. <laughs> okay, so this is when, when you get a, you know, lecture that's uh, someone who's trained to give lectures in person. You move them to the internet. I can't actually hear y'all at all. Okay. So this is the habinula. Okay. The habinula. I think the habinula is the most interesting part of the brain that we almost know nothing about or like most people don't aren't aware of the habanula but the habanula is like critical so the first thing is the habanula is called the stalk of the pineal gland okay so for those of you that know the pineal gland produces melatonin <clears throat> but in meditative traditions the pineal gland is really important it's the physical correlate of the third eye. Some autopsies done in the 50s and 60s found that lifelong meditators had engorged pineal glands. So you take these monks that like meditate all day and their pineal glands are huge. So the pineal gland is somehow associated with like spirituality. And generally speaking, for most human beings, the pineal gland shrinks over the course of your life. Unless you meditate a lot, in which case it's engorged. So the habanula is responsible for a couple of things. It's responsible for anti-reward. So what that sort of means is that when, when we think about 
things that we will dislike, the habanula is involved. So the habanula, like we think about, you know, dopamine is like when we like something, the nucleus accumbens and dopamine activates. When we dislike something, the habanula activates. The habanula is also where we get expectation from. So, for example, like right now, everyone's talking about how Tears of the Kingdom is such a great game. So if I hear lots of great reviews about a movie or video game or something like that, I form an expectation. If I form an expectation, my enjoyment of the thing is likely to be lower. So what part of the brain governs this principle? It is the habanula. Okay? The last thing that the habanula does is since it creates expectations, the habanula does something really interesting. It gatekeeps dopamine release. So just think about that for a second, because now this should make sense. So the habanula, habanula inhibits dopamine. And what does that mean? Let's think about this. If I have an expectation of something, and the expectation is really high, when I actually go and do that thing, it is less enjoyable. If it's less enjoyable, that means there le there's less dopamine. But what is the connection between expectation and less dopamine? It is the habanula. So in order for you to get a normal or a high dopamine response, you have to miscalc... It's kind of... This is where things get a little bit confusing, but you essentially need to, like, miscalculate your expectation. And this is something called a positive... Let me think about it. Positive error prediction reward calculation. So basically what this means, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain it hopefully a little bit better in a second. So first thing is that as soon as we have an expectation, it inhibits dopamine. That's why it's less fun. So in order to bypass that gatekeeping, what you have to do is have an unexpected joy. Does that make sense? Because the second I have an expectation, I'm going to gatekeep and I'm going to inhibit dopamine release. But if my experience is unexpectedly good, i.e. the habanula did not predict it, then you get normal dopamine. Okay? Now, let's understand this. This also kind of explains why, oh, like, I went to work and I was not expecting to have a really good time. And since I had a really good time, man, that was so much fun. So lack of expectations lead to enjoyment. Expectations lead to less enjoyment. By the way, associated with the pineal gland... I'm wondering, does that have anything to do with monks and meditation? Really interesting, right? Because what do like what all these like monks teach? Like, what do we teach? Let go of expectation and enjoy will be yours. They figured this out. So a lot of our meditative practices act on the habanula by letting go of expectations. And this is where even when you look at addiction, <laughs> why do we get addicted to stuff? We don't get addicted to stuff because it's as fun. It's, it's no, we don't get addicted to stuff because it's just as much fun every single time. Think about when you play a video game. You play up one video game. So I play Dota, right? So like, let's use MOBAs. Let's be fair. Half of the games are shit. Why on earth do we keep playing? Because every once in a while, there's that one epic game that you did not expect. And it blew away your expectations. Outmaneuvered the habanula. Gave us this burst of dopamine that we never expected. And holy shit, that is so reinforcing that we're going to do it again. So when you talk to people who use drugs, they're chasing that first high. This is why they call heroin chasing the dragon. Right? Because every time you get high, it's not the same. You want that first experience again. You want that pre-expectation experience again. You want that like epic game every single time you queue up. But the more epic games you have, the less epic they become. The less enjoyable they become. So you need more. This is the cycle of addiction. This is why addiction is a trap. And it all comes down to the habanula. We're, we're looking for it. Because think about the things that you're addicted to. Think about why you fucking keep getting back with your ex. Such a train wreck. Because there was that one time, man, it was, when it's good, it's so good, baby. Let's go, son. 
I know it's not always that good, but it could be that good this time. I know that 15 times it's been shit. Let's get back on that horse, son. Let's... She's texting me again. Mm, yeah, let's go. I'm feeling bad about myself. Let's text her. I know it's a train wreck, but remember, remember back when it was good, baby. Let's go back there. I want that again. All of that shit comes from the Habanu. Y'all with me? Questions? Does that make sense? I have no idea if I'm making sense or not. I have never heard addictions taught in this way. I've never seen addictions taught in this way. So I have no idea if what I'm saying makes sense. But do you all understand? That's why we get addicted to stuff. It's not because of what we expect. It's because we are chasing the unexpected. Because when we first used that substance, it was beyond our wildest dreams. And if you all have used drugs, you know exactly what I'm talking about. That first time that you really got high, it was like, wow, there is a dimension of life that people who have never gotten high do not understand. There are the normies out there. And then if you use something like heroin or cocaine or meth, you get this whole other, you've unlocked some weird bonus realm of life. And then your whole life is spent trying to get back to that bonus realm. But the problem with our fucking neurocircuitry is that the more that we use, the further away from it we get. And we're chasing it and chasing it and chasing it. And it happens less and less and less. And then we habituate to this, right? And then we enter, enter the crap zone. Remember, there's the original use. Then there's the habituation. Then there's the word screwed phase. Where now even normal life is no longer sufficient for us. Mediated by the Habanula. Okay. Now, I think that's neuroscience. <clears throat> so let's explain. Let's go back to this idea of what makes us addicted. Okay, so we're at one hour, so we're going to go for maybe 30 more minutes, okay? I'm going to try to wrap up. So what makes us addicted is our relationship to the thing. And hopefully this makes sense now. So what do you mean by the relationship to the thing? For some people, alcohol is just alcohol. But for some of us, it is the way that we manage our emotions. It is the way that we connect to other people. It is the way that we feel normal. It is the goal of life. Because man, do I feel like I'm living. So as we get addicted to stuff, we start to run into different kinds of problems. Okay? So, <clears throat> let me just... Rest my voice for a second. Okay. So as a result of some of this, these problems in the insula, and as a result of some of these problems with kappa receptors, we become hypersensitive to negative internal states. And we are also blind to negative internal states. So what does that do to someone? It messes with their relationships. Okay. So we also have like relationship problems because we don't independently develop in those traumatic situations. And we become really reactive to the way to the to our circumstances. And so what happens when you put all this stuff together is like you're not living your life. Life for someone who's addicted feels like if y'all ever played those games where you jump on a platform and the platform crumbles away, and so you have to jump onto the next platform and jump onto the next pl platform because just to advance and survive, there is no stability. This is what life is like for someone who is addicted. Your whole life, every day you get up and the ground is crumbling away and you've got to jump to something else. You've got to jump to something else. You've got to jump to something else. There is no security. There is no stability. You can't be with yourself. Just sitting there by yourself is complete torture. So this impacts our relationships. We turn to other people, not only our substances, but we turn to other people to meet our needs. And then the problem with being addicted is that you're actually kind of two people. 
if you look at people who are addicted, they have the part of us that is like, oh my God, things are crumbling. And then the, the, there's the part of us that is actually jumping and landing it over and over and over again. So what you see in people who are addicted is that there are two people. One is falling apart and one is crushing it. Right? There are the times where you're high and there are the times that you're actually living life. You've got these functional alcoholics that are going into work every day and they're crushing it right, left, and center. You've got people who you're in relationships with and on some days they get the good version of you where you're like, mm, let's go, you know? Dr. Chad Thundercock in the house. And then other days they get that reactive person. They get the terrified person. They get the person whose the floor is crumbling underneath them. And so the life of someone who's addicted is like some kind of weird ping pong between two states. Either everything is falling apart or things are going amazing. And then what happens is like, what do you need for things to go amazing? You need the substance. And so you avoid that part of yourself that is crumbling. You avoid the negative emotion. You avoid, you react to your emotions and you seek things outside to fix you internally. That can be relationships, that can be stuff at work, that can be drugs, that can be whatever. So the basic problem is that you are not comfortable with yourself. So then what we end up seeing, as you go through life like this, there are other consequences that develop. So we're just going to focus on one, which is the development of shame. So as people use substances for longer periods of time, the one emotion that tends to rack up is shame. Because the, the cognitive parts of you, remember your higher order brain functions, your analysis is intact. It's all these other parts of your brain, like your expectation circuitry, your learning circuitry. You can't learn, but you certainly know there's a problem. And so then what happens is you start to realize like, holy crap, like I'm, my IQ is good. I'm talented. There are things about me that are good, but I keep screwing it up. And so paradoxically, what you see is the most devastating self-esteem in people with addictions. But the more devast the most devastating self-esteem are actually comes from the people who are the most capable. Because the more capable you are, the more of a fuck up you are if you don't reach your potential. And that shame piles up over and over and over again. And as the shame piles up, remember, we're emotionally reactive. So what do we do to fix it? All kinds of things out there. As we do things out there, as we react to those emotions and we use more drugs, we engage in more unhealthy relationships, our life moves in the wrong direction. The more that our life moves in the wrong direction, the more squandered potential we have, the more shame we have. And what is our antidote to shame? Get high. Then we're stuck. With me? So, now, how to fix it. Good news, very fixable. Very, 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 very fixable. Now I'm going to hit, hit you all with a lot of stuff, okay? So, what we're going to do to understand how to fix it is we're going to understand brain stuff. We're going to understand medication. We're going to understand psychotherapy. We're going to understand <coughs> all of the different deficits in the brain and things that you can do for each deficit in the brain. We're going to understand relationship stuff. We're going to understand identity stuff. We're going to understand professional stuff. We're going to understand spiritual stuff. We're going to understand everything because real addiction healing requires work on each and every one of these levels. And for those of you saying, oh my God, am I screwed? You're not screwed at all. There's a lot of low hanging fruit. You can get started in any one of these things. In the same way that all this stuff weaves together, it can be dominoes in the opposite direction. So don't give up. And if y'all think that I have a good understanding of this, or if I've been able to explain something that makes sense to you, have faith that I will be able to explain to you something that will give you a road out of this. Give me a chance, chat. We start with the brain. Okay? And we're going to start with medication. So, 
Hopefully I've explained to y'all that this is kind of complicated. There's environment stuff, there's relationship stuff, there's emotional reactivity stuff, there's spiritual perspectives. This is why medication is important. Because all that crap ultimately functions, comes down to the brain, right? The stress systems and all this sort of crap. The habanula, the gatekeeping of dopamine, all this sort of stuff. The cool thing about medication is that medication short circuits all of this stuff. Just like bypasses a lot of it, right? Because all this stuff has to happen through our brain. So if we look at medications like naltrexone, So naltrexone actually inhibits the positive effects. This is a sign for inhibition. Positive effects of things like opiates. And once we inhibit the positive effects, what does that mean? If we inhibit the positive effects, we are shutting off the dopamine in the nucleus accumbens. If we are shutting off the dop uh, dopamine in the nucleus accumbens, we are not reinforcing that behavior. And there's also something else really think cool that we're doing. We are not learning bad behavior. Do does this make sense? Because remember that the nucleus accumbens is responsible for learning. And this is why you keep on doing stupid shit. Because the part of your brain that is actually learning is separate from the part of your brain that does conscious analysis. Completely different circuits in the brain. And so once we shut this thing off, then like all the learning of the bad behavior also gets inhibited and it helps people. Okay? So there are lots of medications that you can use. The advantage of medications is that it just takes one of these pieces and it just short circuits them. And then you, you get all kinds of downstream effects. We're not going to go too much into medications, but they can absolutely help. Okay? Now let's talk about the different brain parts. So remember we talked about the insula. The insula is responsible for introspection. The core of the problem is with no introspection, this is an I, we are unaware of emotions. And if we're unaware of emotions and we are reactive in nature, then what's going to happen is we're going to go about using drugs or whatever you're addicted to without understanding why. You're just going to wake up one day and you're going to be like, yeah, like yesterday I was able to resist, but today I can't resist. What's different? Who the fuck knows? Maybe the phases of the moon. No, it is because there is emotional unawareness. So there are literally studies that will show that people who have addictions do not know what they are feeling. So how do we fix this? Things like body scans or even things like psychotherapy. These are both things. And the goal here is emotional awareness. We even have had our community event of right in the feels where we like trained people to increase their EQ. We suspect also things like coaching will increase EQ. We have a study on that that's running right now, so we can't say that 100%, but we're pretty confident. So you may say, what, what's the point of a body scan? So here's something that you can do. If you want to strengthen your insula, be aware of what you're feeling in your body. Chest tightness, stuff in the throat, Pilo erection. That means your hair is standing on end, right? When your hair stands up. And so then what you can do, because we're emotionally unaware, right? And the other reason that we're emotionally unaware is because we grew up in a situation where we were, where is this? Didn't I write this somewhere? I guess not. Oh yeah. Nope. I didn't write it. So we grew up in a situation where we were not emotionally taken care of. So as a result of not being emotionally taken care of, we don't know what our emotions feel like. So we start with body scans. What are you feeling in this moment? Start to release that tension. So this level of meditation, a body scan meditation, can help us with insular improvement. When we do things like psychotherapy and our, our therapist articulates our emotions for us, it strengthens our insula. Once we understand what our emotions, that we're feeling something, then we can develop alternatives. 
The problem with developing alternatives, and this is the problem that a lot of people run into, they're like, okay, I'm addicted to stuff. I should develop alternate coping mechanisms. It doesn't work. You're just like, okay, maybe I'll install an app and start meditating. Why doesn't it work? Because you don't even know when you're supposed to use the coping mechanism. You're kind of like developing this coping mechanism in a vacuum. And instead, like, the coping mechanism needs to be used when you're using an emotion or feeling an emotion. And as you use the coping mechanism when you're feeling an emotion, that will reinforce the behavior and you'll actually learn how to cope in an alternate way. Teaching people to cope, coping mechanisms, when they're like on the beach, doesn't do you any good. You need to learn how to use coping mechanisms when you actually have something to cope with. And if you are emotionally unaware, you don't even know what you need to cope with. Okay, so solution number one, just the insula. We have so many other options. Okay, so body scan meditation if you guys want one thing or therapy. Yeah, okay. Remember the next thing we talked about incentive salience. And what is incentive salience? I may not have explained it very well. This is basically conditioning. And what does that mean? That means that our brain learns that there are associated stimuli that get us ready. They start to release dopamine. And induce cravings. So if I go to a restaurant, I'm going to get hungry. If there's candles and incense and Marvin Gaye playing, you know, and someone puts on their robe and wizard hat, then I'm going to get aroused. <clears throat> okay? So one of the things that we need to do if we want to conquer cravings, we have to get rid of the associated stimuli. It has nothing to do with like conquering. Actually, conquering craving is not right. It has to do with decoupling the stimulus from the craving. So what we can do, <clears throat> this is why when people are trying to get sober, you know, they stay away from bars. So keep good company. So if you have friends who get high every weekend, don't hang out with those friends. If you have a problem with drinking, don't go to a bar, don't go to a barbecue. Think a little bit about what are the things that induce my cravings. There are a couple of other things that you can do, though. So this is where a plan of avoidance is what you need. And then some of y'all may say, but I can't avoid that stuff forever. Of course not, but you don't need to avoid it forever. You just need to avoid it long enough so that you can take care of all of this other stuff. And when everything else is fixed, you can go back into the environment and you will have no trouble whatsoever. I used to be addicted to video games. I love playing them now, but it ain't no problem. You can strengthen everything else. It's an issue of what you want to tackle first. So you need to think about what are your triggers and avoid the triggers that lead to craving. Some of y'all may say, but that's hard. No problem. We'll give you another option. The other thing that you can do for conditioning is, so that uh, very practically, that's like if you have a problem with games, avoid Twitch streams, you know, avoid subreddits, all this kind of stuff. Okay? Just for a while, uninstall. The other thing that we can do is decouple. The stimulus and the association. This is my favorite. <clears throat> so one way to decouple is to actually just get close, but don't engage in it. So this is where if we look at exposure and response prevention. This is a very important principle from psychiatric treatment, where what we'll do is, like, if someone has a phobia, they have an association. Let's say someone's claustrophobic. So the thought of going into an elevator is associated with a physiologic response. You're not even in the elevator. But even thinking about the elevator causes some kind of response. And so what we want to do is decouple that through continued exposure. Okay. So every time we think about an elevator and nothing bad happens, we actually, our response decreases. So if we spend a lot of time thinking about going into elevators, eventually thinking about going into an elevator is not scary anymore. Doesn't trigger the physiologic response. 
then the next step that we're going to do is we're going to go and look at the elevator. We're not thinking about it. Now we're actually seeing the doors open and close. And then now this will trigger a response. We're going to keep doing that until that's no longer scary. Then what we're going to do is we're going to step into the elevator and we're going to step out of the elevator without riding it. We're just going to step in and step out. That triggers a response. We keep doing that until we become good with that. And then what we're going to do is we're going to step into the elevator and we're going to close the doors, but we're not going to go for a ride. We're going to let the doors start closing, then we're going to hit the open door button. So this is the principle of exposure and response prevention. So this has to be done at some point with addictions. And this is where I'll use an example. I wouldn't recommend this for things like heroin, right? Like you don't want to like walk up to, you know, like look at a bunch of needles and stuff. But eventually you need to. But in something like video games, I'll give you all a simple example. So if you're addicted to a video game, sit in the lobby for 15 minutes. And then quit. Just load up the lobby, hang out for a little while, and then quit. Do it intentionally. Set a timer on your phone. Sit down. Load up the game. Don't queue. And then quit. Okay? So those are the two ways that we deal with the conditioning aspect. Because there's all kinds of associations that are pushing us in a particular direction. Next thing we're going to talk about is the Kappa circuitry. So remember that addictions activate our, make our stress circuitry hypersensitive. So what, what that means is that if you are stressed out, you are way more likely to use. And this isn't just an emotional coping mechanism kind of thing. That is there too. What this means is that literally our stress circuitry is like hyperactive. So this is why if you look at people who get sober, they will go to places like rehab. What is the value of rehab? It's like a low stress environment. Right? You've got all these super expensive rehabs like out on the beaches in Miami and stuff like that. And you're like super chill and you get massages and you do yoga and all that kind of stuff. And why is that? It's because it's a low stress environment. It's really hard to overcome addiction if you're in a stressful environment. Very practically, what this also means is that you can do meditations that reduce your stress response and activate your parasympathetic nervous system. So these are uh, practices like triphasic breathing, Nadi Shuddhi Pranayam, Anulom Vilom, extended exhalations will lower your stress levels. And as they lower your stress levels, they will make you able to resist addiction that has nothing to do with dopamine or, or emotions or anything like that. It is simply controlling that variable of stress. You can also try to reduce the stress in the other dimensions of your life if you're trying to get rid of an addiction. And this is where, I know it sounds kind of weird, but like as an addiction psychiatrist, sometimes people come in and they'll be like, okay, I want to like get sober from alcohol. And I'm like, not yet. And then they get really confused because they're like, but isn't alcohol bad? It's like, yeah, but you're not going to succeed until you put a couple of things in order in your life. You have to have a low stress environment. No, don't have to, but it makes it way easier. And this is where if y'all are thinking, oh my God, it's so hard to do this stuff. The whole point of this stuff is as you guys do these individual things, getting sober will become easier. And at the end, it's almost effortless. Once you control for all of these variables, which you can do a little bit at a time, that's how people get sober. They fix one little thing at a time instead of this big problem of overcoming my addiction with willpower. That's a recipe for failure. Okay? Now, let's keep going. All right, next. Okay. <laughs> let's talk about PFC, impulsivity. So one other thing that I would recommend that y'all do is... Practice restraining your impulses. And there's one really good example of this that I think is just a really simple thing that you can do, which is pray before eating. 
So generally speaking, we know that the brains of people who are addicted to stuff are more impulsive. And so what we want to do is create tiny, tiny situations where when we're about to enjoy something, we delay that gratification for a little bit. Overcoming an addiction is not about conquering the addiction. It is about riding out the impulsive urge. That's what you have to do because the craving won't last forever. You just have to out, you have to procrastinate basically is what you need to do. And so when I say pray before eating, I don't care if you pray to a particular God or you don't even have to pray to God. You just need to stop before you eat and intentionally close your eyes. You can give gratitude. You can pray to God. You can, you know, do some kind of invocation for hope. Just close your eyes for a second and express some amount of gratitude. Hey, I'm about to eat this food. I'm grateful that I'm here right now. I know my life is hard. If you want to ask for help, you can ask for help. Like you can ask for help from the divine, the universe, whatever. The key thing, though, is that I think one of the interesting things that, that's happened is if you look at a lot of spiritual practices or religious practices, they help train our brain in particular ways, like fasting, praying before eating. They train us to delay gratification. Another thing that you can do is before you play a game, like we said, sit in the lobby. So anytime you queue up for something or you're playing a video game, wait five minutes on the loading screen. Just wait five minutes. And you're like, that's boring. That's the fucking point. Learn how to train your impulsivity. And you can do a five-minute delay. Okay? Now, next part of the brain that we're going to talk about. Have we talked about that? Yeah. Um, so there's another thing. that uh, There's another technique that we have a whole video about called urge surfing. And that's to recognize that cravings are by definition temporary. And so all you need to do is ride out the craving. If you can control the impulsivity, eventually the craving will go away. Okay? So just ride it out. Next thing that we're going to talk about is remember that there are prediction errors in addictions. What does that mean? That means that I don't understand the consequences of my actions. I don't think about the consequences of my actions. So there's a technique here called play the tape through, archaic now, ancient knowledge, because we don't have tapes, through to the end. So anytime you're thinking about using, play the tape through. If I use today, what's going to happen tonight? What's going to happen tomorrow? How will I feel tomorrow? What will work be like? What will studying be like? What will my relationships be like? Will I cook for myself? Will I eat out? What'll happen? What's going to happen day after tomorrow? Think through all of the consequences of you deciding to use tonight. Will you exercise if you use? What will happen to your diet? Will you work on your screenplay? Play the tape through to the end. What will this weekend look like? Play the tape through. Just think it through all the way to the end. And you don't have to do this perfectly. So there's going to be some resistance from people like, but how do I know what to think about? And I don't think it helps. All what you are doing, it's not about doing it successfully. Y'all have to understand, the point of doing this is that there is a part of your brain that cannot predict the future well enough. So it's going to fail. You don't have to do it right. You just need to keep practicing it. And as you pr play the tape through over and over and over and again, your brain will literally learn how to predict. As it learns how to predict, it will actually restrain you from using. It'll become automatic. You don't need to do it right. You just need to do it. And the brain will take over. The fundamental problem in addiction is that the brain is working against you instead of you it working for you. And so what we need to do is just tr like just use it. It's not about doing it right or wrong. It's just about like getting the rust off. Right? I don't need to exercise. I mean, there's benefits to exercising right or wrong, but any kind of exercise will move me in the right direction. I just have to go for a walk every day. That'll move me in the right direction. 
So don't let the perfect be don't let perfect be the enemy of good. Okay? Now, the last thing, so we um, we kind of talked about emotional awareness. We talked a little bit about reactivity. So the general goal of this is to reduce reactivity. Okay? So remember that the core of the problem is to <coughs> is that my relationship with myself is not good. My ability to tolerate my impulses, my emotions, all that stuff is not good. I seek other things to fix those problems. <coughs> so now <coughs> what I'm going to end with is sort of like a psychological, narrative, spiritual sort of perspective. So these are all the circuits, but there's a deeper layer to this. So when I have these circuits that work this way, I end up living a life that is less than ideal. As I live a life that is less than ideal, I become ashamed of myself. As I become ashamed of myself, I start to form an identity of a per particular person. I'm a bad person, and I feel shame. So what I want you all to really understand is that as I form this identity, I don't want to be that. I don't want to feel this shame. So what do I do? I move away from here and I go out into the world and try to try to fix things out here. I'm constantly trying to get away from myself. I'm constantly trying to get away from myself. And the more that I try to fix my life out there, the worse it becomes. Because then what ends up happening? I start engaging in relationships where if I can get this person to love me, I will feel good about myself. I use another person's esteem of me as a substitute for my self-love. I throw myself into work in a really toxic way. Because if I can be the best at work, I can feel good about myself. And then what happens is if my self-worth is tied up into work or tied up into relationship, my life becomes a ping pong ball. And a good day at work makes me feel good about myself. A bad day at work makes me feel bad about myself. I lose control of my life because I don't get to decide how I feel about myself. They get to decide how I feel about myself. And as they get to decide how I feel about myself, I can't control them, but you know what I can control? Whether I get high today. This is the core of the problem. It's all an externally focused problem-solving strategy. Someone saying I'm addicted to addiction? Absolutely. This is why we have an addictive personality. How do you fix this? You have to be okay with what's in here. So from a psychotherapy perspective, that means working on your shame. You got to go and talk about your shame right? And then what happens is as you work with a psychotherapist, what they're going to do is they're going to help you understand that, hey, this ain't your fault. Or even if it is your fault, this is really wild, just because it is your fault does not mean you are a bad person. Making a mistake does not make you a bad person. If you understand that, you've got one of the biggest steps figured out. If you don't understand that or that feels foreign to you, that's what you need to work on. A mistake is an action. It's not a person. The problem is that so many of us grow up in situations where our actions become our value. We don't get to be decent human beings and get B's on tests. Whether I'm a good human being or a bad human being, did I get an A or did I get a B? So you have to tackle that shame, whether you want to journal, whether you want to go to therapy, whether you want to meditate, whatever you want to do, the shame must go away. And once the shame goes away, then we can start to develop an identity of ourselves that we are comfortable in. And does that make sense? Like that's, if you're ashamed of yourself, you can't be happy with yourself. The shame is what's getting in the way of your identity. And this is where, at the end of the day, the real value of spirituality is that the true self is behind all of that shame. So I don't know if this kind of makes sense, may not make sense, but I'm going to say it anyway. 
because there may one percent of y'all that understand this and for those of y'all that i'm gonna say it what i am is me it's neither good nor bad arguably it's divine sometimes it's amazing there's some kind of inner peace the problem with people with addictions is they have no access to that inner human being who is peaceful between me and the inner peace that we talk about with meditation or enlightenment or whatever is this wall of shame and negative identity so anytime i move internally all I experience is shame and negativity. And so then I have to run away from it and I have to externalize my attention. I have to either have sex or binge eat or play video games or use drugs to get away from my internal self. I'm running away from myself. But the problem is that the real stability of self-worth is actually on the other side of that wall of fire. It's on the other side of the shame. It's on the other side of the low self-esteem. And for you to realize that actually you're just you. You're perfect. There's nothing wrong with you. Can you acquire additional skills? Absolutely. Can you become a better human being? Can you become a better student? Can you become a better father? Can you become a better partner? Can you become a better friend? Absolutely. But there's not anything fundamentally wrong with you. And so the real cure for addiction is to connect with that part of you. And so this is why we see that spiritual healing for addictions is so powerful. That once you realize that, hey, what is on the inside is not something to be, not something I need to run away from. The addiction will collapse like a house of cards. And I have seen it happen over and over and over again. Once you realize that there's decentness in here, you don't need to run away from here. You don't need to run away from your emotions. You're not a pathetic human being. And then you don't need to cope with anything. Do y'all get that? Addiction is coping. There's dysphoria that we don't know how to deal with. And if we take away the dysphoria, which is exactly what the addiction tries to do, but only temporarily, once we no longer need to run away from ourselves, we don't need any kind of addictive substance. There's nothing to run away from. So if you really want to conquer addiction, it's all of the above. The end goal is to love yourself. Be okay with what's happening in here. As emotions arise, you deal with those emotions in here. This is where the emotion takes place. As you start internalizing your awareness, you will start to conquer the addiction. But before we get to that point, we sometimes need to do things like psychotherapy or get some kind of help through journaling or whatever. And in addition to that, there's all kinds of other stuff that we can do. We can practice body scans to increase our emotional awareness. We can play the tape through to the, the end to help our brains make stop making bad decisions. We can control our impulses either through focusing meditations like Trataka is really good for that. There are all of these deficits in the ad addicted brain. And we think about that as a bad thing. In a sense, it obviously is. But the good news is that for every deficit, it is something that you can fix. It is something that you can work on. And as you fix one thing, the next thing will become easier. The next thing will become easier. The next thing will become easier. As you reduce your, the sensitivity of your kappa receptors, you will literally need fewer, fewer drugs. Literally. And so there's absolutely like, I don't care how bad your life has been. I would say that I've seen one or two patients out of probably 5,000 that I think are unable to conquer addiction. Literally unable. But the success rate is like 4,998 out of 5,000. And I'm not saying that those 4,998 people conquered addiction. What I'm saying is that there are only two people that I can think of that I do not think that this will work for them if applied in the right way. <coughs> Questions? One hour and 35 minutes, chat. Take some time sometimes.
will you take a break to heal your throat? Yeah. But this is more important. <clears throat> I probably got 10 minutes of voice left in me, so make it good, chat. Um, why wouldn't it be possible for them? So I think sometimes the the neurocircuitry is just so hardwired. And sometimes there's like just such a severe lack of self-awareness that the person really needs like an externally controlled environment to manage their addiction. <laughs> Here we are talking about how to help 4,998 people and everyone's like, why well, won't it help everybody? I got to be honest. I, I just think that, you know, there's limitations to this methodology. Okay, what's your take on experimenting with microdosing with psychedelics? So let's talk about psychedelics for a second. So I've had some patients who have had positive outcomes from using psychedelics, even to overcome addiction. Um, that being said, I think that psychedelics you have to be really careful about because even the clinical trials that suggest psychedelics are good are clinical trials that are done in a very controlled way. And by controlled way, I don't necessarily mean just medical. What I mean is that the therapeutic value of psychedelics seems to be very tightly linked to the environment and processing that's done afterward. So when you do like 16 sessions of psychotherapy with like two or three doses of psychotherapy, uh, psychedelics to process appropriately, that's what leads to good outcomes. Even in our old spiritual traditions, like you look at like shamanism or something like that, they're not just done by someone sitting at home who's feeling bad about themselves. They're done under the guidance of someone who is adept at their use and has a whole structure of safety around it. So... <clears throat> We have to understand that it is not the psychedelic that is responsible for the healing. It is the whole package that is responsible for the healing. So that's why I would strongly advise against them because we just don't really know. And I've seen lots of examples of like psychedelics being used by people who are depressed and it just gives them PTSD. Like, so it's playing with fire, right? So can fire do a lot of good? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely but it can also do a lot of bad. Microdosing, I'm even more against. So this is where if we look at the, the scientific data, there's, there's scientific data that supports the possible therapeutic value of actually high, higher dose of psychedelics. So there's you know researchers at Hopkins talk about the heroic dose. So you need to use limited, it seems like clinically what is probably going to be good is Limited use, but a sufficient dose. Microdosing, I think there's actually a meta-analysis that came out recently that shows that it's like probably pretty harmful. So I know it's like all the rage, but that feels to me really much more like a, an addiction as opposed to like some kind of growth-related thing. How do you suggest procrastinating on a drug or, or waiting out a craving? So check out our video on urge surfing. I don't know exactly what it's called. It may be called something else. Um, but I think that's where like, you know, you don't have to resist all of the urges all the time. That's where we want to control things like environment so that the cravings are manageable. So <clears throat> if I'm in early stage recovery and I go to a bar where everyone's drinking and alcohol is my drug of choice, it's going to be really hard to resist the urge. It's easier to put, perhaps resist the urge to go to the liquor store and buy something because there's a long gap between urge and action. So you first thing you want to do is try to set your environment up so that you cannot quickly capitalize on an urge. So a simple example when I'm working with people who are addicted to gaming is I'll tell them to log out of all of their auto login things increase the barrier that you have to overcome because that'll give you time to ride out the urge. And then you could use things like breathing exercises or going for a walk or even just getting up and like pacing in your own house 
Um, you can also do things like splash cold water on your face. Though all of those things will help with urges. And then you can also do things like train a habit. So you may say, okay, but if I have an urge to play, it's hard to get myself up to splash water on my face. So then what I would say is build a habit of before you play any video game, you're going to get up and wash your face. And you're going to log out of all of your devices. And then if you do those sequence of things, your gaming will actually go down. What types of psychotherapy do I recommend? What a great question. So the short answer is it depends. So psychotherapy, the recommendation of psychotherapy is based on you as well as what your goals are. So for addictions, I think motivational interviewing is excellent. <clears throat> but I also think that depending on what kind of addiction you have, you may really want trauma-informed therapy. Um, I'm a big fan of like mindfulness stuff. I think we've sort of figured out that mindfulness adds a layer to therapy that is just additional. It's just like additional gravy. So it, it doesn't, it's just a net positive. So I think we are sort of discovering that any therapy, therapy gets you so much value. And then if you add some kind of meditation on top, there's just an additional value to be gained. Can you be addicted when you quit weed for months? Maybe, probably not. But this is where you have to think a little bit about your relationship to weed. So one of the trickiest things that people will do is they will, their addictive brain will give them a hurdle to jump over before they get free use. So if your brain is like, oh, like if you're really addicted, what your brain may actually do is say, hey, if we can quit for a week, that means we're not addicted. So then we're fine. Then we can use as much as we want. So it's really interesting to think a little bit about how the addictive brain works and how it'll sort of like, it'll set targets for you that will allow you to be convinced that you're not addicted. And once you're sure you're not addicted, the ad addiction can run wild. <clears throat> what are your thoughts on food and sugar addiction? Everything that I've said applies. So what we sort of know is that there are some common mechanisms to all addictions. And that's like a lot of the stuff that I was talking about, about managing your internal stuff with external things. And then we also know that there are some unique things to different addictions. And there's a reason why <clears throat> some people get addicted to food. It's because the way that they're wired makes them vulnerable to that particular thing. And there are particular nuances to food and, and sugar addiction for sure. But everything applies. Why do I have an addictive personality even though I grew up in a healthy household? What a good question. So I can't say for you specifically, but let me think about this. So a lot of times we have addictive personalities because we grow up in situations where we are taught to manage our internal emotional state through some sort of external thing. But sometimes we have, let me, let me, I don't know if that makes any sense. Give me a second. Let me think about that again. Okay. <clears throat> If we grow up in a traumatic household, sometimes we'll develop an addictive personality. And what is an addictive personality? An addictive personality means that I use something outside of me to fix something inside of me. That's the core of an addictive personality. That's why it's an addictive personality. You don't get addicted to just one thing. You get addicted to all kinds of stuff. And why is that? It's because fundamentally, the way to fix what's in here is by using something out there. And it doesn't really matter what that thing out there is. So if I feel bad about myself, if I'm unhappy, one way to fix that is to get other people to love me. So I get addicted to relationships and sex. Another way to fix feeling bad about myself is to use drugs. 
right? Because I can make those negative feelings go away. Another way to fix the insecurity within me, I don't love myself, I'm not worthy of love, is to accomplish a lot of things in the external world. To be number one, to be CEO, to be a millionaire, to be an alpha. Because I don't feel good about myself. So I have to prove it. I need proof. And the only time you need proof is when you don't have belief. Right? So if I don't believe I'm a good person, I need proof. And so you can even have an addictive personality if you grew up in a healthy household. Because the core part of it is how do you feel about yourself? What do you get from pursuing that thing? Diving into this, diving into that, learning this thing. And oftentimes what you'll discover is that you're using that thing to fix something in here. And I've seen addictive personalities in people who grew up in happy households. But even in those happy households, there are subtle things going on. Remember that 64% of the population has adverse childhood experiences or traumatic experiences growing up. 64%. But when 64% of people look at, when we look at people growing up, it's not like 64% of their people think that their childhoods are traumatic in some way. The number seems way lower. And so you can cause that psychological damage with unexpected things. <clears throat> yep. 64 is high. Trauma and addiction absolutely go hand in hand. Addiction and ADHD go hand in hand. Um, there's, uh, we have a, vi uh, 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 a YouTube video about ADHD and addiction. Cause if you look at a lot of these neuro neuroscience stuff, right? So impulsivity, frontal lobe, executive dysfunction, all that stuff makes you vulnerable to addiction. Can a fa family appear healthy when it isn't? Absolutely. <clears throat> so this is the other thing to understand is that even healthy families can be unhealthy, right? No family is perfect. No parent is perfect. So the unfortunate reality is that you can try to be the best parent that you can, and you're still going to screw up your kids in some way. And so the process of being human is in recognizing, like, I had a great childhood in a lot of ways. I also had a video game addiction and all kinds of problems. Just be, No one's perfect, and that's part of humanity. And so what you have to do as a human is, like, recognize, okay, what did, what did your parents not do perfectly? Which you can't blame them, because it's not like they go to parenting school and for, like, 50 years before they have kids, right? Most of it is instinct and what we're taught. And then you have to do some work yourself. What books do you re recommend that are insightful, helpful, and recovering? Probably um, The Body Keeps the Score. It's a book about trauma. But, <clears throat> you know, I read Gabor Mate's in the realm of hungry ghosts, and it's like, okay. Like, I think it's a really great book in some ways, but maybe just not my cup of tea. I, I, I guess here's, here's the big problem that I have, is people will ask, what books do you recommend? So what's the purpose of reading a book? The purpose of reading a book is to gain some sort of information or understanding. And when I think it comes, when it comes to addiction... This is actually half the problem, is that the information or understanding that you need isn't going to come from a book. You're looking in the wrong direction. Look within yourself. Like, I know it sounds kind of cliche, but really, I think that's like a huge part of it. Is that people with addictions look to the outside to fix what's in here. And even looking to the outside to educate yourself about what's in here is going to be worth a fraction of what you can learn by paying attention to this. If you want to know what book to read, write, read the book that you write about your own internal experience. Write a book about why do I do these things? How do I feel about myself? What is it that increases my cravings? What is it that decreases my cravings? Why is it that I'm able to resist a craving on one day and not resist a craving on a different day? How to quit porn. So, 
A good question. So how to quit porn if you've tried everything. So remember that addiction is very hard to overcome in a vacuum or in your current state of life. So the number one variable that correlates with pornography addiction is meaninglessness. So if you really want to quit pornography, what you need to do is build a life of meaning. And what that sort of entails is some amount of introspection. Like, what do you want from life? Because if you want to quit pornography, you have to re have a reason to not watch. And the whole problem is that you don't have a good enough reason to stop watching porn. For my health, what is that? For my relationships, to help me move forward. Why do you need to move forward? What do you really care about? So I'd say if you're struggling with pornography, go and do something substantial for other human beings. Number one. Go like volunteer or whatever and do it consistently for like six months. That'll help you develop some sense of meaning because pornography addiction is all about my relationship with my internal feelings. I'm bored. I don't feel good about myself. Pornography addiction is an emotional coping mechanism. So you have to feel good about yourself. And you can't just overcome that by stopping watching pornography. You have to go and do something on the outside. And the second thing you've got to do is ask yourself what you want from life. And then once you understand what you want from life, if you're like, I don't know, or I guess I want what other people have, that's not good enough, right? It's not going to actually motivate your behavior. And then the third question you've got to ask yourself is once you figure out what you want from life, what are you willing to sacrifice in order to get it? Are you willing to sacrifice pornography in order to achieve that thing? And the answer is probably going to be no, which is why you need to go back to question number two and keep asking that question until you find something that it is worth giving up pornography for. And until you find that thing, you're going to be addicted to porn. Okay, maybe time for one more question. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay, this is a good question. Okay, so, man, so many good questions. Okay. <clears throat> All right, let's start with this one. How long does it take to reverse the changes of addiction? So I'd say that within two weeks, you see some reversals. Additional reversals will start to happen in about three or four months. I think there's another kind of like, there's kind of like plateaus of progress. So even within one week of sobriety, you'll start to see some changes in the brain. Three to four months out, you can still see some long-term changes. 12 months to 18 months is when you really start to see some solid changes in life. Not within you, but within life. And then I would say three to four years out, you can be completely different. Because once you start seeing that momentum, it takes time for momentum to build. So just to give you all an example, I had a, a patient who was addicted to heroin. It took him about one week of sobriety, two weeks of sobriety to like stop feeling terrible every day, but they still felt, felt kind of crap. So they felt kind of neutral until about four months in. Four months in is when they started to feel good, like feel normal. It then took him about 18 months to decide to enter into a graduate program and become a therapist themselves. And about three years out, they finished their degree and like, you know, gotten a nice place that they were renting, had like a nice house, 
were in a stable relationship and were like starting to earn back money. And then like four years out, they were like living a normal, happy life where they were helping other human beings, had a mortgage, were engaged. That's how long it takes. Thoughts on 12-step programs. So I think 12-step programs can be good for a fair chunk of people. But if a 12-step program doesn't work for you, there are all kinds of other alternatives to 12-step programs. Aren't we just replacing, replacing addictions with addictions? Not really. So some people wonder whether life is a series of upgrading our addictions. So I used to use drugs to cope. Now I use meditation to cope. Am I still not just coping in life? So if you feel like life is a series of upgrading addictions, here are the breakpoints that become really important. So the first is, if you move away from drugs to a healthy coping mechanism, are you still coping? Yes. But the big difference is that once you use a healthy coping mechanism, the coping mechanism does not create additional damage. So when I use drugs, it causes me more problems. When I use a coping mechanism, I may not fix the underlying issue, but I'm not hurting myself in the future. So that's the first break point. But you're still right that as long as you're using a coping mechanism, it's not fixing the underlying problem. And that's where the real freedom from addiction comes in. So once we start no longer needing to cope, that is when we're done with the ballgame. We've won the game at that point. Now, how do you get to that? We conquer the need to cope when the stuff in here is no longer bad. So if I feel ashamed of myself, if I don't love myself, if I lack the ability of self-compassion, I need to use drugs. That kind of self-hatred, I can then replace the drugs with meditation, which is healthier. And as I replace it with meditation, I stop screwing myself up in life which then l really tills the soil for self-love. But eventually what I want to do is get through that shame and start to realize that I'm actually a decent human being. And once I realize that I'm a decent human being, I don't need to meditate every day to avoid negative emotions or cope with medita uh, uh, negative emotions. Once I love myself, I can start to meditate every day to build something positive as opposed to get, something neg uh, get rid of something negative. And once I do that, then I've won the game. Okay? All right, chat. Can THC be a good thing? Sure. It can. So we know that, for I think, like, the best examples of THC being a quote-unquote good thing or in patients with chronic opioid addictions or people who are in chronic pain. So we know that THC can be used as a harm reduction strategy for people who are on very high pain, pain medication. We also use THC, have used THC for decades in things like cancer treatment because it does things like stimulate appetite when you're in chemotherapy and you don't feel like eating anything. And so we, we've, I mean, we've been using THC medically for many years. So it can, it can be a good thing, absolutely. All right, chat. So thank you very much for coming today. Um, you know, for those of you all that caught this a little bit later, maybe go back and watch the beginning. So today we did a deep dive into addiction and sort of trying to explain like what y'all need to understand about addiction. It's not about the details of a particular substance or diagnosis, but how can you understand how and why an addiction forms? And once we understand how and why an addiction forms, we also lay the foundation for how we can fix it. And so hopefully that's been helpful to y'all. We're doing a lot of stuff like this during Mental Health May. St so stay tuned to our various channels and things like that. We'll be bouncing all over the place. We're going to be doing travel. We're showing up on some podcasts. We're doing some interviews. And we're trying to basically figure out what is the most high impact stuff that we can do. 
part of the reason that we're doing deep dives on trauma and addiction and not deep dives on things like depression, anxiety, ADHD, or meditation is because we actually have deep dives for those things already as Dr. K's guide. So if y'all like today's stream, but you want even more, right? So we've got about 20 to 30, 35, 36 videos on topics like depression, anxiety, meditation, and ADHD. So check out Dr. K's guide. We also have things like worksheets and exercises, a lot more details on how to implement solutions. Like here is the actual meditation technique for this particular problem. We just don't have time for that. So just to give you all an example, um, you know, each guide has a script that's about 100,000 words and is like one full week of like videos in terms of filming. And we just can't do that all the time. Right. So today we sort of gave you all 90 minutes on addiction. And if you guys want more on that, we'll we're we may build a guide or something like that. But if you guys want those other topics, we've got way more as well as implementation strategies. So check those out. Um, and then lastly, thank you to all of you for the support that y'all give us. Um, we're really grateful for all the donations, all the sub subs, things like that. We also recognize that a lot of y'all are not able to afford re mental health resources. That's part of the reason why HG exists. We do this stuff in live streams for free. You know, we have all these YouTube videos and stuff like that. We've got another product that's coming out in a couple of weeks. Stay tuned to help y'all even more. Um, we have all these community events on Discord and stuff like that to help y'all learn EQ and learn about your emotions. We recognize that not everyone can afford stuff. And we also, it's really cool, but HG is now in 132 countries. And so we also, you know, recognize a lot of y'all don't have resources. So we're going to do our level best to produce as much stuff as we can and make it as uh, available as, as possible. And so huge thank you to everyone who supports us in terms of donations, trying out our products and services. So we take all of the revenue to build additional stuff. And even if there's no revenue, that's actually okay. So huge shout out to platforms like YouTube because we earn ad revenue and we use that revenue to build free resources for y'all. And the last thing is that if y'all can't support us financially, totally fine. It actually really helps us if you share our work with your friends. So even sharing your work or sharing videos or watching videos or being a part of the community actually helps us. So, you know, like, subscribe, all that crap that people usually say, um, it actually does make a difference. And so we're going to do everything that we can to build the best resources for you with the resources that we have available. So thank you all very much. I hope that y'all learned something. I hope that this is going to be helpful. Stay tuned to our channels. And also, if y'all have additional questions, check out other YouTube videos because we talk about you know these various meditations and things like that. So good luck. Take care. And we'll see y'all maybe Monday, 